Well, good morning, my friends. It's your old pal, Jordan the Lion. How are you all doing today? I hope you said well. Today, I'm coming to you from Melbourne, Florida. It is a beach town. It is a naval base town. And it is the birth town of the lead singer of The Doors, Mr. James Douglas Morrison, better known to us as Mr. Mojo Rising, the Lizard King, Jim Morrison. Days with Jordan the Lion, it begins right now. And this is gonna be a tricky day. We have been fighting continuous rainstorms the entire time I'm here, which, you know, I guess that's very fitting. Little riders on the storm, huh? Now I know Joke have been driving around for the last two hours waiting for this rain to stop, looking for anything related to Jim, and there's not a whole lot here. But I'm gonna take you to his first home. All right, so we have entered the neighborhood that in December of 1943, James Douglas Morrison was born in this town. His father and mother were here because his father was in the Navy and was going through training. Now, I don't think it would be fair to say that this is where Jim's whole life started in Florida. Look at that, in the windows they have all kinds of pictures of Jim. What a great tribute. I don't see a um, historical placard or anything. That's unfortunate, but I said it's not fair to say that his life started here because his cousin Bruce in 2013 was selling a home in Pensacola, or was trying to, and was advertising it as the home where Jim Morrison was conceived. <laughs> so I don't think, as I said, I don't think we can say that this is where it all started for Jim, but this is where he was born and this would have been his first home. What I think you could say is that this is very likely where he learned to walk. Definitely where he would have learned to crawl because the Morrison family didn't live here very long. It's crazy to think that someone who would make his image and his name as a rock and roll rebel um, would actually be a, a genius that was raised as an, a military brat. He traveled all over the country as a uh, kid growing up. He was born here in 1943. From here they went to Washington DC, then to New Mexico, and his sister was born in 1946. So that tells you how short of a time they would have had living here. Now I think that this is an interesting place because, you know, Jim would have had his foundation here. I don't know that he would have remembered anything here, but he went on to be one of the voices of his generation, someone who spoke for um, the people of that time that didn't know how to put their voice out there. And for being such a flamboyant and amazing uh, rock star to watch he was a poet first and he actually tested at genius levels when he was a child so it's pretty interesting to think of those lyrics and to know that this is someone who loved everything from jack kerouac to mad magazine but he uh he did come back here he didn't have a long time here like i said probably at most two years but as the family moved on he would talk about when they moved out to New Mexico. That was like kind of his early memories. Uh, that's where he would talk about that story of riding with his family and seeing the crash off to the side of the road in the desert where he um, saw the Native Americans involved in that crash and he believed that one of the Indian spirits possessed his body. And that was the Mr. Mojo rising thing. So he eventually as he was growing up, he went to high school in Virginia, but when he went to college, he came back out here to Florida to go to college for a while. And then against his parents' wishes, he decided to transfer to UCLA, Los Angeles, where he could study film. Now it just feels like Jim would have been a natural performer to watch him in any kind of live performances, those old concert footage, the stuff when he was performing on TV. He didn't look like someone who just naturally was a, a performer. And it was, I guess, probably lucky that he met Ray Manzarek eventually because Ray was someone who was a, saw the potential. He actually saw 
the brilliance in gym and um, Ray had a band called, I think it was called um, Rick and the Ravens with his brothers in Los Angeles while he and Jim were going to UCLA and Jim didn't go to a lot of concerts but he said he always saw in his mind him as a performer with a band and the music, he could feel, he could sense it all, he just knew it was supposed to be, but he didn't necessarily have the um, self-confidence to go out and be a performer. He was a poet. He was writing things, and he was just living that kind of bohemian lifestyle. And then once he graduated from UCLA, he planned on going to New York City, but his life changed on the beach in Venice. Because what ended up happening is, he was writing these songs, didn't have the music, but he was writing the lyrics and he knew they were songs in his head. And he ran into Ray Manzarek on the beach and started talking to Ray. And Ray's like, I thought you were going to New York City. And he said, I changed my mind. He said, well, what are you up to? And he said, I want to do some music. I'm writing songs. And Ray said, well, sing me something. And Ray just saw the brilliance in Jim right there in the lyrics and loved it. And got him to join his band with his brothers. And... Uh, then they eventually changed the name to The Doors because of Huxley's book, The Doors of Perception, had a uh, very deep meaning to Jim, and they got signed to Columbia after doing a demo. But Columbia was never really interested in making a record, it didn't seem, at least they drugged their feet for a while, and The Doors started to go out and to work on performing. Now, like I said, Jim didn't have a lot of self-confidence, so when he would perform, sometimes he would stand with his back to the stage or he wouldn't look at the audience or he would stand off to the side of the stage. They would perform um, a residency at the London Fog at first and then eventually work their way over to the Whiskey. Columbia dropped them, Electra eventually picked them up and because Columbia had dropped them, Ray's brothers just, they didn't think that anything was gonna happen. So they ended up quitting the band and they didn't even have a drummer originally at the time Ray had met John Densmore at a meditation class and got John to be the drummer, which was a perfect fit for what eventually became The Doors. And then once his brothers quit, John knew Robbie Krieger and talked to Robbie. And Robbie said, you know, Jim, or like that band, even though Jim wasn't like a singer at that time, um, they were known because people were saying like they just had amazing songs So Robbie was interested in joining the band went to audition with them and they loved his bottleneck slide part And he joined the band now the doors were one of those bands that was very Different for the time because they didn't have a bass player and their sound was different Jim wasn't necessarily even a singer He wasn't like your natural sense of a singer not like Elvis But he had that he had the same charisma on stage where you just couldn't not listen to what he was saying. You just couldn't not focus on Jim Morrison. And so the band really ended up taking off. And I think each member of that band was a perfect fit for that band. I think they all brought something that nobody else was really doing at that time. Robbie could introduce flamenco and different sounds that people would eventually love and not know that it was such a cultural influence from something else that he had learned years before. He, they were able to take all of their various interests in music, pull it together to create something that was a whole new style of rock and roll. Like I said, I drove all over town. I was really sad to see that there were no plaques or anything really. No murals, no statues, nothing letting people know that Jim Morrison was born here. And that's kind of crazy because for the tourism, you would think that they would want to take advantage of that. But yeah, this was the house that he would have been born in and until they moved away he would have had his earliest memories here now there is one thing I didn't have a chance to go over there yet but we're gonna go over there I was on a whole different part of the town I do believe they have one sign here in town because there is a motel that pays homage to Jim and has actually named themselves after one of his songs let's head over there and not only that, but right beside that hotel or that motel, it's also where Jim was born. I absolutely love seeing things like this. I've done so many vlogs on the doors. I've went to where they filmed LA Woman, and I've went to the Morrison Hotel, and I've went to the House on Love Street, and I've been to Jim's grave in Paris, and I just try and do everything I can whenever it comes to the doors. I haven't done any of the Venice Beach stuff yet. I will do that, but I couldn't come to Florida 
even during a rainstorm that I knew was happening, almost hurricane weather. We're actually getting lucky right now for a little while, but I couldn't come here and not show the home of Jim Morrison. But please, if you own this house, please petition to get a sign out front. I mean, I know some people probably don't want a lot of visitors, but it would just look so great right there. And what's interesting about this house is that it looks really beautiful right now, but apparently it got really run down at one point. So big ups to the people that own it now, because I had seen where at one point the house had been sold for like $225,000. And then the person after that tried to sell it for quite a while and couldn't get any offers or anyone to buy it. And then eventually ended up selling it, I believe for $75,000. So it must have really been in bad shape. Now it looks beautiful and respectable. So sadly in this whole town, there's nothing to remind anyone that Jim Morrison was from here except this kind of flea bag motel, to be honest with you, normally has a sign right there that is, the name of this place is Riders on the Storm Hotel. And they usually have a sign that says birthplace of Jim Morrison, but they wouldn't let me see it. They have it inside, they wouldn't bring it out, and they said that I couldn't go in and see it either. So unfortunately, can't show it to you. But it does say the birthplace of Jim Morrison, and it's not accurate, because he wasn't born in this building, but he was born right here at what used to be the hospital. In 1943, Jim Morrison was born on these grounds. Now what's interesting is that his life was only, you know, a couple of years here, if even that, because his sister was born in 1946 and she was born in New Mexico. And they had lived here. They had also lived in uh, Washington, D.C. before she was born. So this would have been the official birthplace of Jim. Now, what's interesting is that most people know he's buried in Père Lachaise in Paris, but. Um, <laughs> Apparently they have a Hall of Fame in here for the hospital and at one point the man who ran the Hall of Fame was actively trying to get Jim Morrison's body moved from Paris to back here in Melbourne, Florida. Now, I don't really know where he thought that was going to happen. I think if anywhere he was going to be moved, it should have been Los Angeles. That's where he made his home. That's where he recorded his music. That's where he performed and got started and everything. That's where he went to film school. So I feel like maybe it should have been there. And actually my thought was always kind of like, for someone like him, you should do something really dynamic. And since he had a really famous photo shoot out where the Batcave is, the Batman Batcave from the TV show uh, from the 1960s, I always thought he should have been buried inside the Batcave. <laughs> but I mean, I think they were just thinking of doing it as kind of a touristy thing. I mean, that's all I can figure because I don't think Jim's ever going to be removed. Even though I've heard rumors since I was a kid that people who have family buried near him want him removed because of uh, all the visitors and everything causing problems and whatnot. I don't think that'll happen because they have cameras on his grave constantly now. And Jim's father made a deal with a... Paris law firm to take care of the expenses of keeping Jim there pretty much forever. So I don't think that Jim's ever going to be moved, but it's kind of an interesting story to go along with his birthplace, this hospital. You know, the idea of moving Jim is kind of a fascinating one because it's not like he planned on being buried in Paris. That was something that, you know, it was an accidental death or it just depends on who you ask, what you ask. I mean, most of the reports seriously come down to him having an overdose in a bar, in a bathroom stall, and them taking him back to the house, putting him in the tub, and then calling the authorities saying that he passed away. But it, the theory was always that it was heroin overdose and that Pamela had some of it in the house and didn't want them to come check it. So. She never wanted an autopsy done, so they didn't do one, and he was buried pretty much immediately after he died. In fact, Ray Manzarek would say, they got 
people saying all the time that Jim had died or been in an accident, so they never believed whenever those reports came in. They said when they were told that he died, they sent their manager to come to the funeral and the manager never saw a body. They said, you know, unless we see a body, we are not gonna believe it. And they said that he went and when he showed up, the funeral was going on. Jim was already in the casket and no one ever saw him and he was buried. So Ray Manzarek had said, you know, we just, after that happened, we actually just went into rehearsals and we just kept rehearsing music waiting for Jim to come back because we didn't believe that he was actually gone. So it would be interesting if they moved him, they could either A, do an autopsy or B, find out if he really was in there because there was always a theory. Like I said, Ray was never really convinced that unless they saw a body that Jim was actually was actually dead. So he thought that it was possible that Jim could have faked his death and went on to live somewhere else. Pretty fascinating idea, isn't it? All right, my friends, we're gonna call it a day. I hope you enjoyed this vlog. I love the music of The Doors and I love the lyrics of Jim Morrison, him putting his soul out there on the line. I just love that stuff. Go give it a listen. Go listen to Waiting for the Sun or Morrison Hotel or whatever your favorite Doors record is, the first album. Have a great night, everyone. We'll see you all next time. From Melbourne, Florida, Goodbye!